Welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast, where America learns to persuade. <laughs> That's the game. <laughs> we need some help. Uh, find us on Twitter. I tweet jokes all day long at Rhetoric War because Rhetoric Warriors didn't fit because Twitter, <laughs> for some reason, doesn't like to give people enough space to name themselves. <laughs> There's a few jokes, jokes from this week. Um, Trump, we're going to talk about this a lot today. Uh, would have marched to the Capitol with the insurrectionists, but his bone spurs were acting up. Uh, <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, <laughs> it's snowing in Texas. It's been snowing all the, since yesterday, which is God's way of inviting everybody to chill out. Like, hey, you remember snow? <laughs> Take it easy out there. <laughs> uh, Twitter has gotten, you know, uh, a little bit of its gumption up and blocked Trump and, and others. Uh, and the right is very upset because blocking fascists is fascist <laughs> <laughs> and more bullshit later. Uh, go to the blog at rhetoric warriors. Uh, I just posted today addendums to Biden's upcoming oath of office. A few other things that I think he should vow. <laughs> I am Dr. Dan French, American rhetorician, a rhetoric PhD. I'm an escaped professor. Also, stand-up comedian, comedy writer from Late Night in Hollywood. The podcast is designed for three things. We want to talk to comedians about their politics. We'll explore what those brains see. Uh, I find persuasion pros to help you understand the secrets to magically take people from where they are to where you want them to be. And I also convert people from the right. Maybe my favorite thing I do on here, conversions. Political conversions which uh, is about to come out as a full course for, from Rhetoric Warriors. So that's what we're about. Uh, visit us at rhetoricwarriors.com. Take one of our courses. And remember, an untrained mind just isn't any fun to talk to. <laughs> so today, my guest, I'm going to give you a little bit of expertise status because you do have a degree in political science. Master's, right? Yep. Political science. So there's that. But mostly... Kostaki Economopolis is a comedian, 25 years comedian. Yeah. I would say. God, I've known you for at least that long, I think. Um, so my guest today, Kostaki Economopolis, comedian, all around super nice guy, regular guest and guest host on the Bob and Tom syndicated radio show and uh, the founder of All Pro Lines, great NFL comedy concept. Kostaki, <laughs> what's up? Hey buddy, good to talk to you. That's a uh, you got a, you got a long you got a long ramp up on this podcast. That was a lot. You put a lot in there at the beginning. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, <laughs> I'm still messing around with it. I always uh, one of the things I don't like about Mark Maron's park podcast is he takes ten minutes at the beginning and you know talks about himself. Right. But he's so disclosive about all his anxiety and his life, and I don't care. Makes it sticky. It huh. makes you feel like you know the guy. That's the whole yeah. point, right? I totally get that. Um, the only part I really like in that opening thing is getting some jokes in there. So maybe I'll just at some point just cut down to the jokes. <laughs> It'd be like an old school uh, monologue off the top. Right. Yeah. Bone Spurs. Nice. That was a good joke, right? That's a great joke. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, jokes, jokes are fun. Yeah. You and I have been, uh, we, we've been uh, on the joke merry-go-round for a long time. <laughs> That's right. I got, I haven't really... I mean, just to give you a vague overview for me, I listened a little bit to your uh, talking to Tom Simmons, who mm -hmm. Tom and I went opposite directions. Tom and I actually in this very room, uh, 25, 20, maybe 28, maybe 30 years ago, were knocking around jokes, writing stuff together. And I was fresh off my master's degree in political science. And hey. I was putting yeah. little... I was putting little digs and little messages and little ideas into my jokes. And Tom hated that. Tom was like, just fucking be funny. Stop trying to tell people what you think, which is, which is hilarious. Because yeah, that is hilarious. I, <laughs> now I am a lapsed political comedian. I almost never do politics on stage. And Tom is uh, almost completely political, at least online. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's interesting. That is you guys completely were rooted and then like you cross pollinated and, and right. grew up different, you know, 
He cut right. up different trees. That's right. Tom got very uh, angry about things and interested in politics and got passionate about stuff and writes great stuff from that perspective. And I was kind of the opposite. I I feel like I started. I've had. I was traveling around doing one nighters in the south. <laughs> I would pull up in the pickup truck to car ratio in the parking lot was <laughs> nine to one, and I would still go in there and talk about gay rights and how gun <laughs> gun laws were stupid and barely survive. And, uh, and then, uh, I got a little jaded about politics. I got more interested in talking about family stuff and personal stuff. And I also got in the last five ish years, I feel like there's so much political content in our regular lives that just from a practical point of view, I was kind of tired of it. Oh my I God. feel that yeah. they are too, you know, how oh, Trump completely, he cracked open the pinata you know, the political pinata. Americans always hated politics, right? Bored by it. We considered it always to be inane, useless fluff talk, right? We hated it. And then Trump came in and did, you know, reality show entertainment on it, broke up in the pinata. And now it's in every single, like spidered into every single, you know, corner of your life. Can't yeah, get away. That's from right. It. That's the thing. I mean, I, and it, Part of the appeal, in my opinion, in doing political jokes in, the, in my, the early part of my career arc was that I was the only one doing them. It was kind of fun to be that guy. Like, right. well, who else? No one else was walking into a bar and doing jokes that had some a little bit of depth and some political digs in them. And and now it's like you can't flip on anything without hearing political stuff and every Facebook yeah. post and oh, every everywhere. every radio show and every television. It's just so I just from a taste perspective i like wanted a respite from it too so but last week i ended up doing a few <laughs> jokes and uh when the world blew up it was kind of fun to write jokes about every you know i'd say four times a year there's something that happens that everyone is riveted on and so it's a perfect place for jokes because everyone is having the same experience and right. watching the same story and seeing the same photographs and having the same water cooler conversation. So I jumped back in and wrote a bunch of jokes and made some memes and uh -huh. I hey, got a lot the, of, I'm going to give you a radio producer thing. For some reason, your peas are popping. My peas are popping. I yeah. don't know. Is that maybe is it's, it a little, maybe it's your little closer to the mic than usual or something. I'm excited. I'm passionate, passionate. I interviewed Eddie Feldman uh, last week and he I had the Feldman. microphone. He had, you know, sort of a side mic and it was, it kept, you know, going up against the zipper on his jacket. <laughs> and I'm like, you're, you're like this super pro showrunner, dude. <laughs> take, off that, take off that goddamn jacket. Doesn't do his technical stuff. He writes the jokes. Uh, he does it all. He's he's executive show showrunner, man. You know, you gotta watch all those little details. I like that guy. I had lunch with him because of you. Yeah, Eddie's a good dude. So yeah, let's let's I don't know, let's dive into it. Like there's lots I have lots of things I could talk to you about. And maybe we'll shelve that because I'm gonna go ahead and post this one today. Like I've got some others in the can, but this it's just everything is right, you know, it's just exploding. So let's let's talk about it. Let's do a little you know, comedian work on the insurrection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I think it's because of my taste right now. I tried not to be too partisan about it. I was just reacting as a human to this crazy scene that we were seeing. Um, now, are you not partisan because the political aspect of it or because of your career aspect of it? You just don't want to deal with all the blowback. I think it's that I just find it so off putting this summer. I was kind of ended up being kind of partisan almost by accident. Initially, I, I, I was doing the these kind of partisan. I think I've seen that movie. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to bore you with the story, but the short version is I was, I, you were a guest on 50 toast, right? Yep. Sure. So I had, a, I had a 50 when Minneapolis burned to the ground. One of my buddies and my writing partner on uh, All Pro Lines is Brian Miller, great comic out of Minneapolis, and he lives there. So he was my guest on 50 Toast that week, and we ended up talking about what, what he saw, literally National Guardsmen and on his street, and they found accelerants in the bushes in his neighborhood. Like, it was, he was right fucking there. Yeah, sure. So at the end of that conversation, he and I were kind of going back and forth about what to do, you know, what do we do now, and where are we, and 
my mom, who's a very progressive septuagenarian, like watched it and she goes, two white guys talking about social justice. What are you doing? Uh -huh. Which was a great point. And so the next several 50 toasts were about Black Lives Matter. And I had a couple of my black comic friends on and I had on uh, a former cop who's now a comedian. And it was it was great. I had an angry black woman who was yelling at me on Facebook and she wanted to be a guest on the thing. And I was like, well, they keep telling me I need to listen to people. So I had her on. Hmm. It, it was really a cool like yeah, month and a half of is. conversations. Oh, I, yeah, I love doing that. That's that's my thing. Like I even noticed like my first I think you're going to be uh, episode, I don't know, 10 or 11. They've all been white guys. And, right. You know, that's because I'm a flaming racist and, sex <laughs> and sexist. <laughs> but it, it's really just because those are the guys who keep saying yes. I've asked a lot of people, and uh, but it, it's glaringly apparent to me, you know, because I'm not really talking politics. I'm talking uh, process, you know, the the talk process, the discourse process around politics. I don't really care what your politics are. I care about how you talk about politics. And so, but to, just to look at that and go, hey, I need to, you know, I need to know more uh a bigger range of people. Yeah, right. Professionally. Yeah, Cuz these are all I, professional connections and friends, but you know, I look at it and I'm like, no, that's not right. Right. Well, you, you do sort of by the nature of just being human, you fall into a group of kind of your own little universe and when I was kidding with Brian Miller about this, I go, you know, I probably need to talk to, you know, a guest of color. He goes, "Do you want me to introduce you to some people?" I was like, I've... <laughs> Yeah, but you know, like I, I've been in academics forever and that's very <laughs> intercultural. Like I've got tons of international friends and, you know, like, so it's not like that's not my experience in the world and even stand up, you know, stand up is mostly white guys, yeah. but it's also got a big range. And I'm always, I've always been very interested in other people's voices. Like I'm a part of my background's cultural studies because I just love to hear different perspectives, but man, it is hard to stay spectrum uh friendly like it, it's it's hard to to keep going ah i keep, need to keep pushing here to get more and more voices which is one of the reasons why i like to have people from the right on here right you need to understand those people if you're going to try to persuade those people so get them on yeah. here let them talk so i posted something here's here's a relatively benign thing that picture that we all saw with the guy with the horns and the other knuckleheads inside the capitol building yep. you know i posted a, a version of that picture and i said uh the island of misfit proud boys right it's a meme like that's ah, a clever line it kind of captures this crazy motley crew that we're looking at on the tv every minute and you know lots of pushback on that and that's a pretty that's not even there's not even it's anything hard, it's really not a hard punch. It's no, it's not a hard punch. Right. <laughs> uh, so I would like to ask your advice uh, as a rhetorician. Am I saying that word right? Rhetorician. Rhetorician. Everybody adds a T because I think because I'm a mathematician. Is that right? Yep. Rhetorician. Rhetorician. Okay. Work on that. Um, what do you... What do you do with those knuckleheads who they're clearly not interested in facts? Uh, immediately, 18 versions of you mean Antifa, right? You know, like that's the that's the response. And so then I get into this crazy game of like, maybe I'm not looking at this closely. Go do some research. Look at this. Post this. Respond with this article. No, this is from the BBC. Clearly, they'll at least because that's not an American. <laughs> no, they're not. It just I I don't I mean, maybe there's a loose wing nut here or there from the other side that's doing some. Cra yes, but broadly, that's just a false claim. And it's somehow accepted as true by millions of people but how are we supposed to fix this well i think you know when you go in and you actually start to look at the phenomenon of what's happened the human brain's very easy to misguide right it's very easy like these are very complicated issues it's very easy to misguide the human brain and so ergo that's what you know that side of politics has figured out it's like hey you know we can rile people up point them at the wrong villains, at false villains, and we can get a lot of traction. You know, it's, it's a 
in some ways it's rhetoric 101. It's unethical rhetoric 101. So one of the divisions, the strong divisions I push push at uh, Rhetoric Warriors, you know, one of the foundations of the uh, project is I do ethical only persuasion. Like that's hmm. what I train people to. My argument is basically if we just trained everybody to that, like to be able to say, hey, you don't get to talk if you're doing unethical persuasion, we'd hmm. be fine because unethical persuasion is the only thing that can carry uh, those kind of skewed logic thoughts. Hmm. And so they get very good at it. And in some ways, like I admire the far right for its fervor, for its energy, but it's like this misguided uh, patriotism, right? They, they think they're being patriots. It's just misguided. So right. like that broken compass, you know, uh, that, so many people have right now you can go in and, and i do this in, in the first course or the uh i have a course on understanding what the right has done or the rights tactics it's playbook you can do that to people with very specific techniques and once it's there it gets neurologically burned into people's brains and they don't have control over it so they end up saying crazy crazy shit but it's just a neurological program you can go and unprogram it and reprogram it back to where it's supposed to be you know like if the left had the fervor of the right you know just like that crazy energy that felt like you know they're always fighting like these huge evil uh forces in the world and they need to do it actively and you know put their money and all their time behind it we'd be fine <laughs> that's that's not our energy <laughs> huh. I would think like with your stuff, like I have a policy that I try not to let anybody get into, I try not to do multi-log online. Like I want to just be monologue online. Okay. I don't want to hear people's perspective back at me. I don't want to hear their comments. I don't want to hear the reactions because it's, it's a million, I mean, 500 million brains coming at me. And uh, it's just incredibly unhealthy to do that to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, this is such a white privilege thing to say, but this summer when I was, you know, I was posting a picture of me with a Black Lives t-shirt on and I was having these weird sort of back and forth exchanges on Facebook and every, it was hard. It was grueling. It made me feel yucky the whole time. Yeah, it's awful. Awful energy. Yeah, right. Hmm. I'm not, but, I'm not too happy with the whole, uh, use of privilege as the uh, dominant uh, term and all of that. I think it, it gets, it excuses what's the reality, which is um, the way that white people, white culture exists in America is supposed to be the norm. It's not privilege. It's the norm. It's just the other cultures are underprivileged, you know? And so I don't think you should feel guilty, you know, for just existing within a democratic successful capitalism culture what you should feel guilty about is other people are kept out of it right yeah that's a good way to frame that i like that so it's it's a tough rhetoric it's caught a lot of traction but i think it's a tough rhetoric on people yeah. right yeah that's fair i like that a lot i'm thinking about a couple of the beats in my life where you know it could be framed as white privilege and you're right it's not it's not privilege. It's the way it's supposed to, you're not supposed to be afraid of the cops at night and the thing. And when you're walking, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And you would feel it if you, if, if you go to other cultures, like if you go to, you know, a heavily Asian culture or somebody that's, you know, dominant culture where you're not the right skin color, you feel instantly that you are under privileged. You don't know what you're, what to do. You're not treated the same. You can't, you know, the language is different and all those things. So you feel the lack of privilege you know, or the lack of normalcy. So, right. But I, yeah. I tend to stay away from identity politics discussions because they're not my expertise and there's just so many landmines in them. <laughs> <laughs> so what, how, what do you, do I, do I have some social obligation to say to someone who is spouting a, uh, and, an untruth to say, Hey, that's not true. Is that part of my job in, in the society? It's gigantically inconvenient. It is. <laughs> I, I don't do it. Like I, I try to convert people. I don't 
dialogue with people. Hmm. And it's very different. Like uh, the conversion course that I'm launching takes people through a very specific process of, I've designed this from a rhetorical perspective of discovery, like just let them talk about themselves. Like what you need, the first stage of that is just ask them more questions, do more probes, be a good audience for them to say whatever crazy shit they want, you know, because they need to express that and you need to know what they think. Hmm. And then you have to create some kind of a relationship with them in stage two, which is kind of what you did with the uh, Black Lives Matter woman who was getting upset with you. You have to have actual dialogue and, you know, again, use all the sort of relationship techniques that we all know, but we don't explicitly know the terms for them a lot of times, like validating them, you know, validating the, the fact that they feel this way instead of contradicting them or trying to, you know, fight them because that's not how that's not going to create a relationship. Right. And then finally, you can do conversion, which is, hey, let's get in and look at some of your stuff and see if it's right. But if you don't go through those stages, you can't have an effect on people. Hmm. So it becomes just a blow up argument, which is useless and makes you feel bad. So, but so to, so to shortcut that, if it's better to not engage with that universe in short spurts in social media, because there's no way to get to the end result. Zero way. You don't have a relationship with them and you don't know anything about that person. Right. So I, I try not to, let comments, I try not to turn comments on anywhere. It just, I'm too sensitive to it. I don't want to think in terms of guilt and, and worry and anxiety that I'm doing something wrong when I know right. that I'm trying to do something right. I know I'm very clear about what I'm trying to do with my, you know, brand, my business. Um, so I'm trying to make that as strong as I can. It's not going to work for everybody. There's lots of ways to criticize it, but that's not the energy I want. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So let's let's dive into this a little bit. We had major blowups this week, and you're for people who don't know Kostaki Economopolis. That's a <laughs> Italian name. <laughs> that may be a little more Greek than Italian. I can't tell you how many old white guys say, "Oh, an Irish boy." That's their go-to joke when they hear my name. That's funny. Uh, you, you've been a comic for you know probably thirty years, right? And yeah, man. political science undergrad or undergrad and masters. Yeah, and I was on track to do PhD as well, and then I got distracted by uh, joke telling uh, at the I University of Georgia. Right? Yes, that's right. I like so, that better. So let's just drop into there just a little bit. It's been a while <laughs> since you've lived in Georgia, but you know, before the world blew up, Georgia blew everything up. What an amazing outcome to that senator senatorial races. I can't believe it. That story got buried that day. <laughs> oh. Everything got buried. <laughs> That's a huge story. I mean, I this the state hasn't been uh, blue in a long time, and uh, that's a pretty big swing. Any insight into that? I mean, you've lived in Georgia for a long time, and you, you know, you know that that culture. You lived in the South. Um, what's your insight into the Georgia election? Well, I mean, as a Southerner, I, I suppose some of this comes from being defensive, but I I think the South is a little bit. It's a lot like states everywhere else it's pockets of blue and a vast you know sea of red red land in the rest of the state all states have that and the south just has more seas of red i think the the cities are st have always been blue savannah and athens and atlanta and you know atlanta's getting more and more and more blue as more yankees move here and the yeah some of the numbers that came back from those cities especially the late votes like 94 percent blue and you know everybody if you want to get over to your righties and go ah you know it's rigged nobody ever get those numbers but you know when you look at the this voting pattern this time around the blue cities in georgia man crazy right i think I mean, I think it's, I think the answer is, it's, it, first of all, there's demographic shifts happening. The, you know, there's more, there's more blacks, there's more people from international places. There's more people from up north. Atlanta is a very diverse city and it's growing. There's more, you know, folks moving in from different companies or coming here from all over. Uh, and it's activism, Stacey Abrams and all that. I mean, they've, they found a, they found a way to activate the power that has been dormant 
for a long time. So yeah, I, think I would it's love both those to things know more together. about the nuts and bolts of that, like how much effect that actually had, because it got a lot of play in the media and she's, she's, you know, just a powerhouse, um, at least the way that she's portrayed. And I don't know anybody on the inside there, but you know, the boots on the ground, getting out there and doing the work of politics it certainly seems like she put together the the machine. Yeah, that's right. That's that's what it looks like. Again, I'm not an expert in this, and I've I've been a little bit of a lapsed political nerd, but uh, but that's what it looks like to to a casual observer. So good for her. And I'm and I'm surprised because you know I I'm actually here in Atlanta now. I've been here for a while, and every I mean I'm so glad it's over because the advertising was insane. Every station, every Facebook, Almost a billion dollars. In that I mean, of course, election. they had two two Senate races at the same time. First of all, that's weird. In the same state, to that were to break the tie in the. I mean, that's a huge moment. So if you're ever going to spend money ever, this is. But you know, this here's a political joke for you. You think Kelly Leffler's eye is lazy? You should see her political. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> To <laughs> see her campaign ads. They, I mean, they were really base. They were, they were bad. They, they were, were bad. really awful. Every, the message was, you know, these guys are communists and they're socialists and they're radicals. And it was just, it was like listening to the forties, like, or the fifties, I guess it was, it was literally like, like listening to a Eugene McCarthy, you know, yeah. Nixon campaign. Yeah, It was like a sketch. And I, and I was, I was terrified that it was going to work because it sounded like it would work. I mean, I, it seemed like, it seemed like the people that they were talking to would hear that and be, uh, you know, those are words that they don't want to be, you know, in yeah, power. Those are definitely and the, the, the right, you know, has, you know, there's some tactics that the right uses that the uh, left really doesn't use in the same way, you know, that kind of stain tactic of just taking a devil word and repl and re repeating it over and over and over and over until it sticks. Right. Trump has got the, you know, entertainment chops to do that in a way that makes it stick. She does not. She was wooden, you know, oh, it, clearly yeah. not good at delivering the lines. You know, would a better candidate have won Georgia? Is is a good question. Probably. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Although Purdue is an established thing in this part of the world. I mean, I'm surprised if I was guessing going in, I would, I would guess a split, right? She would lose and Purdue would win, but yeah, it's amazing that a, a black preacher and a Jewish kid won in Georgia. Good for them. Yeah. That's one of those little pockets of positivity <laughs> that you're like, ah, maybe there's a chance the world's not. <laughs> so we had what about a 12 hours of that or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, you know, yeah, Trump, Trump sends the hordes of that's hell right. up to the Capitol. Right. And, and you could, you could easily spin this whole election back the other way and go, look, this was maybe the worst president in the history of America, of America. And, you know, a hundred data points of this guy doesn't know what he's doing and he's terrible at his job and he's a horrible human on the inside. And still he almost won. Yeah, there's a lot to there's a lot to <laughs> deconstruct in all of this, I think. I mean, that should have that should have been a Mondale-esque, you know, repudiation landslide embarrassing, you know, electoral map and it wasn't. Well, I don't know, 7 million, you know, in the popular vote and, you know, 70, you know, in the electoral college, it's pretty, it's pretty strong. Like, it's not that stretchy to call that landslide-esque, you know, Dude. but yes, it's way too close. It's, I mean, it wasn't, couldn't call, you couldn't call it the night of. How can you not? It should be called at 9 p.m. Should have been. Well, they won't let them do that anymore. They don't, they won't let them do the political projections anymore because the right has gone in and screwed with the predicting um, elements, you know, like with the suppress the vote with, you know, all that kind of stuff, the predictive models were screwed because they changed the, uh, you know, landscape on the ground. And so suddenly they're like, wait a minute, this has worked for the last 60 years. How come it's right. not working now? I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with the model. They just screwed up the, you know, the mechanism that you're studying. Yeah. And the and people who vote for Trump are less likely to tell the pollsters what the truth is. Right. So that throws Maybe, things off. Too. I don't know. You know, again, this is the cool 
interesting thing with rhetoric these days. It's there's so many things coming into the center of the pie. You know, there's so many slices that you don't know. Like you never know, like, is that true? Can't polls adjust to that? Surely they can, you know, you know how to work a poll, a statistical, you know, analysis on a poll to make sure that if it's got this flaw in it, you can correct for it. Yeah. But to take the extreme example, I mean, in the old days, it was, it was hard to do exit polls with somebody like uh, David Duke because they wouldn't tell pollsters that they just voted for <laughs> David Duke. So it would throw sure. things off. Yeah. So that, that was clearly a part of it, at least four years ago, when people are a little bit, a little bit shy about being Trump supporters, that might be less true now. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's great. Like, so you've watched you, you were like everybody else this week, where you just glued to the TV watching the insurrection. Well, I was, I was traveling and in the middle of family stuff, but I was so intrigued by, you know, I did take a big window and just like sit and walk. I was like, wait, what's happening? When I first heard, I just thought it was some rabble rousers broke sure. some windows or whatever. I was like, yeah, okay. It's oh, these know. goofy guys. Right. The DC <laughs> police are generally so good at handling this. I mean, that's what they do full time. And I've actually been there for some things and I've, I've been blown away by how good they are broadly, but I, I just was shocked. I mean, I guess every, it's just cliche to say, but I was just, my jaw was open. I was like, what's happening? Yeah. It turns out when you, uh, <laughs> yeah. Handicap the, all the police and turn a mob loose that they're hard to control. <laughs> I love the, the immediately people are posting pictures of what the cop situation looked like when it was Black Lives Matter protests. Yeah, when there was like nothing, no no threat. All of a sudden we got these black ops with no, you know, identification right. and throwing people into vans and disappearing. You're like, what? Yeah, right. Yeah, this is uh this was the opposite of that. This was Paul Blart was watching the building. <laughs> But, you know, it is interesting the way we've been conditioned for so long in America to not expect to expect there to be a top end to everything. Like, oh, it's only going to go this far. You know, oh, they'll stop this. And I made the point earlier, you know, last week when all this was going on, that Trump is so incompetent, he can't even run a good insurrection. You know, <laughs> like the Bolshevik re Revolution, 12 million people were killed. <laughs> you know, here we lost, you know, five and uh, Trump's people, you know, just looked stupid. Like it was just the dumbest, you know, attack yeah. on something that I've ever seen. Yeah, and of course, you know, like, <laughs> like they were saying yesterday, he's learned his lesson. Yeah. What he's learned, the lesson he's learned is not to try to take over the Capitol without a bunch of Blackwater, you know, mercenary special ops uh, in there. <laughs> That's what he learned. <laughs> <laughs> oh. because they were so dis disorganized and it was ridiculous i can't i can't it's just inconceivable that he's the president it's just as a i mean he's been known as an asshole for 30 years like he was a slumlord in new york but he was a clown right yeah yeah but he was right he wasn't taken he was a guest on letterman because he was cartoonish and yeah, interesting he was, he was right. a not beloved, but he was a comic foil in right. the culture for 30 years. Right. That's right. You know, and that's what they said, like with The Apprentice, they transformed him from this comic idiot foil, you know, goofball business guy who loved golden toilets to somehow yeah. a super businessman. And that gave him a credibility that he would right. never have had to be able to run with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's TV. It's it's kind of perfect that it, that TV transformed a, a brand into something that was electable. It's crazy. Well, it's it is the nature again of rhetoric. When people people think of rhetoric, they think of it this old school. And I watched a, a Russian this woman who who was Russian and lived inside of Russia forever and uh, understood Russian propaganda. And she's like, everybody thinks Russian propaganda. Of, as the KGB with guys in overcoats and, you know, the Cold War. She's like, that morphed forever ago. It is so sophisticated now. You know, it can do so many things to you. And people think with rhetoric, they think of like Kim Jong-un or whatever, you know, is it un or ill now? I don't, I don't even I don't know. know. 
not, not sure I understand their naming system. <laughs> About, you know, the fish will rise up to kill you. Shall you try to invade us? You know, like these big, boisterous, clearly untrue rhetoric. But rhetoric is incredibly sophisticated and subtle. And so when you look at TV, which is this perfect world that we've all grown up in, we're completely comfortable with it. And then reality shows come up over the last 10 years and they're just boiling with emotion. That's all it is, just boiling with villainy in those hmm. things. And Trump walks right out of that world and adds in boiled villainy to our politics. And suddenly you're like, it's just too much to take, you know? It's, but it's, but it's inconceivable to me that, <clears throat> I mean, we, Obama caught shit for not having enough experience. He was a U.S. senator. This Trump was never elected dog catcher. Like how, <laughs> how do, well, how do we accept that somebody with zero experience, it, we just love this ethic of the American business success. Like if you can be succeed in business, you could do anything like, and even that's a lie. Even his success in business isn't true. Yeah, we tried, we've tried to elect a business guy president for every year for the last 30 years. Stephen Forbes or Steve Forbes, you know, got, got in there for a while. Ross Perot got in there. That's right. You know, we've tried. We like that pitch because, you know, it has that ethos of super competence and strong leader and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And those guys became cultural uh, icons. But I don't get like for a long time, you know, the wealthy families in, in America, you know, there was a split between the clear robber barons and the democratic wealth, like the Kennedys and, you know, those guys, the Rockefellers at some points. And what happened to them? Like what happened to the, the democratic wealth power that would come up to fight somebody like Trump, like Bezos and all these guys, you know, uh, Johnny, hmm. Johnny, uh, Microsoft, Bill Gates is getting rid of mosquitoes in Africa. Right. What about getting rid of, you know, insurrectionists in America? <laughs> <laughs> Where are these guys? How come no democratic wealth, you know, has, has risen up on that side to balance against the, uh, the right wing wealth? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. I, you're right. There, we sort of had these images of these different families for all these years, and that's largely gone. And the and the one family that's sort of in our mind's eye, the Clintons have so many negatives, they can't even run anymore. They, like the world's given up on them. Well, and the Clintons were, you know, late to politics. They, they weren't, they had no money, you know, right. came from poverty in Arkansas. Right. There's lots of entrees into politics, you know, and I think you hit on one perfectly about business, you know, as something that people have always been like, yeah, let's, let's try that a business guy and run the country, but they picked a soulless business guy like Mark Cuban or Richard Branson. One of those guys is a, you know, sort of ethical businessman. And right. There's, there's lots of, you know, iffiness in that or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. But that's, that's a good point. That's a very different cut of human. Right. They would never do that. Right. You know, Mark yeah, Cuban, that's right. you know, those guys would get in there and act like that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so did yeah, you write right. any jokes about the insurrection do you have any humor about what happened no it was i it was just a, for me it was just a it was a playground for a day and a half of writing memes about the images that we saw and just goofing around with it i didn't write any good hearty meaty political statement jokes at all i was just i was just playing in the universe for a while i i, I enjoyed it i know do you ever feel uh, like you've been pulled off the the main team, you know, I know like, so for people again, who don't know Kostaki, Kostaki a great joke teller. He's been a long time stand up, like a hardcore joke guy. Like you craft jokes and you like to tell joke jokes on stage. Right. And really good at it and successful with it. And then you morphed over and started doing that with football because you're a huge football fan, Atlanta Falcons, which is kind of a football team. <laughs> you, you made that a brand and then you got into Bob and Tom kind of doing both, doing general humor and also NFL humor, which is a massive platform. What do they have, 5 million listeners? Yeah, I mean, in the old days they did. That's probably not true anymore. Radio is not what it was, but but yeah, they're a giant ship that's sinking very slowly, right? <laughs> radio, I don't mean Bob and Tom. Radio as a platform is, to me, they're the, they're the networks of, 
you know, like in the old days when the cable came along, they're like, oh, the networks are dead. Like, no, the networks are not dead. The networks are still doing some of the best stuff that's being done, but they'll never be the monsters where there were only three choices, you know? <laughs> right. So yeah. literally there's probably, how many people do you think know, know you? And just in America? Could well, that's an interesting people. question. I, I, I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, when I took the rental car back, the guy at the, at the desk was like, Hey, Kasaki Economopolis. Huh. I didn't know you're in town. I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, there are 72 <laughs> people at the show. Uh, thousands and thousands of people in this town know my name, but c connecting with them and getting them to get a babysitter and buy a ticket, like that's a whole nother level of thing. But it just is. in terms of name recognition, man, it's probably a big number. I don't, I don't know. It probably is. I bet you, I don't know, two, three million people would recognize your name. Yeah, probably north of that in terms of just sheer recognition you know, recognition, like, oh, it's a comic from the thing that I know. It's probably a bunch bigger number, but that, but to be able to, but so then you have that number and then you've got a, and then the number of people who actually like connect with you enough that makes a difference for you business-wise is a tiny fraction of that number, right? Sure. Harvesting it from a, a business capitalist perspective. Sure. That's one thing for real. Right. And, you, know, you and I work in that business and we try to figure these things out all the time. But that's an amazing uh, amount of exposure that, you know, if you look at the history of the world, you, you've got to be in the top, you know, <laughs> zero, 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 one percent. That's an interesting way to see it. It's I guess that's that's no, that can't be right. There's so many characters that we all know. There's so many. No, there's sm it's always a small subset. We're in that world. So it feels like, <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody's a comic. Everybody's, you know, done Hollywood. Everybody's been on the radio. No, nobody has. Hmm. All right, I'll take it. So you could, so you've got, you've got a limited platform, I would say, right? Most of your platform access is probably due to the quality of your football knowledge and turning that into comedy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. That's what people expect to hear from you. That's what they have heard from you. Yeah, and sort of, you know, family jokes like mainstream i'm a grown-up in a crazy world comedy is kind of what they know right that's right so you couldn't really haul those people over into your politics at this point right it's an interesting question you know who's done that recently and it surprised me and i and i almost backed into having a conversation with them about it is steve hofstetter steve hofstetter very mainstream sort of grassroots internet fame youtube sensation you know uh, that guy's a marketer nobody loss nobody works harder and and with more veracity like i remember the first thing he came out after uh, larry the cable guy like that was his first you know avenue up into fame of he released a, a i think maybe a special attacking larry the cable guy and so right he, he's like I said, he's gotta, worked all the angles. Ooh, yes, for sure. Marketer. Uh, but Steve has now become very political and he's having the opposite experience that most of us who aren't are worried about. Uh, you know, for me, I've got lots of red state listeners who like football jokes and, you know, that's a big slice of the world that I'd, I'd hate to give up on. Sure. Um, and for Steve, he's kind of gone the other way. He's just like, he is political. He's committed to it. He writes hard, crashy, partisan jokes. And he's having the opposite experience. Like he's kind of given up on the red universe and is counting on the retweets and the exuberance about what he's saying in the blue universe. And so he's, he's made a hard left turn. It's been interesting to watch. Yeah, and that's, I would say politic, like if I were advising somebody, at least with comedy and politics that's the way to do it like i you know a friend of mine said who i've had on the podcast said to me yesterday he's like because i asked he's a business guy and he was a little worried about you know saying anything uh, inflammatory because in his world you know that's that's a problem and so i let people come on anonymously you know onto the show because they have something to contribute but i don't want them to get any blowback because that's not what they're about right and but he said to me he said well you don't you know uh I, I don't, I don't want to be like your politics. I'm like, I said, no, my politics 
our own, like the main touch point in my politics, number one is I just care about the way you talk. I don't care what you believe. And Ooh. number two, I don't like the right because they're no fun. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's a horrible country for comedians or people who love fun if it's a conservative country. <laughs> it just doesn't fit. So I vote for the funnest people. The funnest. I don't know. Some of the, there's only a handful of, of uh, conservative comedians I can think of. They're pretty fun. Tim Wilson was fun. Uh, yeah, but Tim Greg, Wilson was not. He was Greg so, Hans. He, he was fun. not socially conservative. <laughs> All right, fair. That's fair. He partied, right. you know, had a black wife. Yeah, that's uh, right. Fun to talk to. You know, pretty accepting of whatever. Would take shots at you know the whole spectrum of things. That's a good point. Socially liberal, uh, quietly maybe. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. He came. I did a show with him once. At Charlie Goodnights. And this is when I'd been at Good Nights in North Carolina for a while. And I knew those audiences so well. And he packed the room, best audience, you know, you could ever talk to. And so I knew how to play those guys. And I just blew the room open, you know, with 20 minutes up front of him. And I walked off and he's like, hey, why don't you uh, headline? <laughs> why, don't you, why, don't you, why don't you get up here and headline this show? Damn, son, you gonna make me work. Don't bring a guitar next time or anything because I don't want to work that hard. It's <laughs> a nice compliment. From the I master. love that guy. He was, he was, and he was smart too. So yeah, very smart. Yeah, he's great. Uh, you know, Drew Hastings is fun. He's completely right out of his mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to talk to him at some point because I see people, <laughs> and I've got friends like this. The weirdest phenomenon these days is the smart people who get caught by the right. You know, it's a weird webbing that I don't think really has been there. The right has always had an intellectual tradition, like George Will and you know, all those guys, there's always been a, a hardcore intellectual tradition in the right. And I get it. And that's why I know like the conservative tradition in America is different than the far right tradition in America. Yeah, that's right. I got no problem with William F. Buckley. He's got some good points. He does. They, you know, all those that, guys like you could sure individual responsibility. We can't let that one go. You know, I get yeah, it. Yeah. You know? And I listen to some of Reagan's old bullshit. Um, and he's pulling off that stuff. You know, he's literally just going into their intellectualism and he's extracting a little piece of it and feeding it to the people. That's right. It's fine. You know, we've always had, to me, it's stability versus change. Like those are two massive megas in a, you know, human experience. And the right is stability and the left is change. And it's like, you know, negotiating those so that the culture moves forward and can adapt to innovation and that kind of stuff, it just slows it down as opposed to let's just leap over and let's all be naked all the time. Right. You know? um, which is a little fast for most people. Yeah, I get it. I'm, I'm okay with, with slow change, especially on the big things. It has to be, you know, <laughs> as long as you're going the right direction, that's fine. <laughs> so I, my politics I was really are not like, I'm not really even political. I don't really care. I just want a fun country. But you, but come on, yeah, that's not true. You, you're a social liberal for sure, right? You want your kids to have rights, whether they're gay or not, as a, as a silly example, right? It's you much more fun that. to have rights for everybody. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but no when fun we oppressing were, people. But when we were in high school, being gay was a fucking problem, and now it's not. That's a big. That's a sea change in one generation. Well, it's it's not a problem in you know the blue state blue state uh, city. Okay, I'm exaggerating to make the point, but it's the the landscape for a gay teenager is dramatically different than it was when we were in that in that universe, right? That's good news. That's change, but it has to happen slowly, right? I guess it has to happen slowly. Like I wouldn't make it slowly. I would make like these changes are not. There's no justification for uh, racism or sexism or genderism or any of that stuff. Like there's right. zero humanist justification for it. Right. Other but than I it makes you uncomfortable. Of course. Of course, those things should happen quickly, but they're not going to. And I sort of accept that that's the path. As long as you're going in the right direction, I'm okay with it. Well, part of my thing, again, is um, with Rhetoric Warriors, one of the programs, I'm going to do this as a sub-program that's going to be free. It's Convert One Conservative. Like if every liberal would quit worrying about responding to everybody on social media and pick one conservative person in your life 
and focus on them and do conversion work on them. <laughs> I like this. You know, even if you got 10% of them, they'd never win another election. <laughs> wow. All right. That's compelling. That's so a good convert argument. one conservative. I'm going to show you how. All right. What do you have in your life that's conservative? I think um, we Drew Hastings. I think we could go get him. Yeah. <laughs> Drew Hastings is a funny example. That's for sure. I, yeah. I, I like it looks that. It's like guy, Nick, but... uh, Nick DiPaolo, you know, great stand up, writes great yeah. jokes. Everything else is politics are insane. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I when I see I'll see something that Drew posts on Twitter, I'm like, what? <laughs> isn't Augie what? Smith, isn't he another one? No, Augie's Augie's an old mensch. He's he's not right at all. He's he, he's he's left. He's left for sure. Didn't he? But wasn't he doing a right wing or white collar thing or something for a while? Not I don't that know I know him very of. well, but um, that would be news to me. He's pretty. Yeah, he's he's pretty he's pretty earthy. He's pretty earthy, regular dude. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I've always had, uh, I've got an uncle that I'm a little worried about who's, uh, you know, <laughs> he's got some strange uh, perspectives on things right now. Um, let's let's yeah. pick that guy. Why don't you go and convert that guy? Okay. Well, let's let's learn me learn me how to do it. Where how, where do I sign up? Where, where do I go get this? Well, there are some free webinars on the site that are literally a conversion. I just did a, f a free one hour of each one of these the stages of here's discovery, here's creating a relationship, and here's doing actual conversion. Um, but you have to, like, since this is somebody in your family, typically you just have to open a conduit to be able to communicate with them regularly without challenging them at all because you have to st establish a relationship, right. a political-oriented relationship. Okay. Nobody's going to do that if they feel like you're going to, you know, attack them. Right. But they're typically okay if you tell them you're going to convert them because they don't believe you. This seems like a challenge, right? They're like, I, I tell people all the time, like, well, don't talk to me if you want to, you know, I'll convert you off anything. You want to lose your religion? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good failed Catholic. I've got lots of good conversion tactics on Christianity. I eat too many cashews. Can you help me with that? Uh, you know, I probably could. The problem with, <laughs> like, you know, my first... That was my first one person show was about losing 125 pounds. Yeah, that's I'm right. back up 40 pounds now because of the stupid, you know, pandemic and, <laughs> you know, just carb, 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 carb. <laughs> like I got to have something. Uh, um, the, yeah, the problem with doing diet conversion is that, you know, the intellectual stuff doesn't really help you very much. Oh, that's interesting. It's more of a emotional kind of. Well, it's emotions pattern. and really it's more of the uh, autonomics. It's more the physiological control, like uh, cra uh, cravings, you know, like carbs are the only thing that you crave. Like, hmm. You know, you can only eat so much fat steak. Like steak is great. And every once in a while you'll think about it. And then after you have a nice big steak, you want one other steak for like two weeks. <laughs> you can eat cake and then go, oh, that pie looks good too. You know, right. wow, some that's chips. interesting. Just will be getting yeah. out too. And then it just doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. That's so a harder one. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so are you doing any political jokes in your comedy now? Not really. I mean, I, you know, I, I like the Jake uh, Johansson level of political comedy where there's just enough of a hint that it sort of tells you where he's where he is without he really no jake's no no Jake's. he's got himself. a he's got a facebook live that he does every day right i think so he does something with his wife yeah, I, yeah I've, and, I've popped in and out of it here and there and i haven't watched it enough but i got the feeling that it was a little but i was also kind of looking at uh, scott adams the dilbert guy who's a crazy right winger oh right at that time and um yeah, so I don't know if Jake's righty or not. There was a great meme that uh, somebody posted yesterday that said uh, it was that it had the two it had a picture of two dogs that were looking up at the owner, and the room was just a disaster. Yeah, and yeah. It said, "Thank God you're here." And Tifa did this. <laughs> I like that level of political comedy. That's not too in your face, but it just makes a great salient point. You know. I, I would like to maybe do a little bit of that kind of thing going forward. 
I don't know. We'll see. I, I mean, I, I love the idea of diving in and just, I mean, I could do all pro lines. That's all, you know, I could do a version of that. That's all jokes for the left. I mean, I could build a whole brand about that and dive into that and be passionate about that. I just don't, I don't know if that's a good choice for me personally, but I like that point of view and I like that playground of writing that kind of stuff. It's just a know. different, yeah, it's just a different world. When you, when you dive in over there, you're going to be dealing with all the things we were talking about earlier. You know, people will yell at you about your Falcons or, you know, making fun of their football team, but it goes away instantly. They're yeah. Not. And it's fun. The Falcons suck. We can all agree, you know, yes. nobody's right. going to be dragging you out of your car and beating on you because you, yeah, that's right. bad about the, that's right. The Packers yeah. this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I kind of, I've, I've dabbled a little bit this week for the first time in a long time. And like you said, there were no hard punches. It was just fun to play in that universe. Uh, I, it would be fun to punch hard some in that universe. It would. Oh. And I, I kind of, it's one of the reasons why I like the podcast and maybe I'll do some aggro podcasts at some point with somebody, you know, that can, that can punch back like a Nick DiPaolo or somebody like that, you know, where, like sports, the cool thing about sports is that it re, it renews every year. Nobody loses their livelihood, you know, because of liking the Cowboys. Yeah, right. It's a safe space to have conflict, you know, and right. politics needs to be that way too. You know, there's no safe space right now because, again, guys like Trump came in and heightened the conflict to the point where nobody can talk, you know, anymore. Like the right. idea of me, you know, trying to convert somebody, like I'm not going to, I don't need to criticize the right. I've got a series on the, uh, on the blog about why I think the, the right is wrong. And I've got, I'm up to like, I think I've put eight points on there and they're long little, you know, blog, blog posts. That's an oxymoron, but they're blog posts about why, they, why they're ide ideologically wrong, you know? And you can look at those and like, I'm just presenting my perspective. You can easily take a different perspective, but I have intellectualized why I feel this way. Right. And stated it. And ergo, you can now go, oh, I understand why you said that. I'm going to counteract it. You know, right. and then you've got reason discourse. And then that's what all rhetoricians really want is that's an ethical process versus somebody going, you, I'm going to kill your bunny. Yeah, right. It's nah, crazy how fast it gets. Well, you're not funny. Like, uh, okay, okay. You yeah, know, like they're... some, they just try to say the meanest thing they could think. <laughs> Why is that the indictment? for? But community? that's that we we're having a, I thought we were having a, I got a question for you, if you don't mind me asking on here. Yeah. Um, I'm intrigued by the parlor problem, right? So parlor wants to be the place where they don't tell you what to do and you could say whatever you want. And then people leave Facebook and Twitter to go to parlor. And then, and then Parler has to stop a guy from talking about shooting Mike Pence, <laughs> which is hilarious. So we all agree there have to be some boundaries. It's just a matter of where they're drawn and to what extent. Is that really what we're fighting about? Yeah, free speech. I'm working on a thing with it because it's a very complicated concept. And we don't understand it very well. And it's poorly named. Like free speech does not encompass that issue because it's not that they can't say anything they want you can say whatever you want that doesn't mean free distribution you know and it doesn't mean i have to hear it and it doesn't mean there are there are not consequences right for what you've said but you can say it but there are consequences and so all this violent talk is not acceptable in any culture you know outside of like when we're at war you know, with another culture, then it's okay to be incredibly violent in the way you talk about people. But in normal civilized culture, violent talk is the same way, like, you know, sexual crime talk and all that stuff. It's very problematic. So nobody's going to be able to open up a free speech platform and get away with it. Just yeah. Can't, that can't that didn't, it. it didn't occur to me that they're you literally can't do that because there's always going to be boundaries that we insist upon. And if you're not doing it, you don't get to play. Right. Yeah. And talk, talk, isn't just talk, talk has real world effects and that's the issue. So, you know, comedy yeah. gets pulled into that all the time. Like I'm sure you've 
been you know accused of this as well that for comedians there's not supposed to be a mor moral morality to comedy it's supposed to be just is it funny right yeah and so but people want to pull it back over and say you're normalizing you know uh, attitudes towards women and you know things like that with those jokes right and you're like well if you want to pull it over into the dramatist i'm having an actual effect on the culture side of things sure but that's not comedy anymore yeah it's interesting i i feel like well eddie murphy had a you know one of the tracks on his first album was called faggots you know um, i have you rewatched it like was it prime was rerunning it for a while you can't watch it his yeah. opening is so 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 i i i think we should evolve through culturally forward and it shouldn't be boundaries per se, but we should grow up as humans in the way that we speak and the way that we entertain our entertain each other. So I think those conversations are all viable and useful, but I do. I also feel like comedy should have a little more leeway than these other places because that's, that's the joy of it. You're in a dark room and you're having a drink and you're saying something that maybe you don't say in polite culture. There's a naughtiness and a fun and a joy and, playing with ideas so i i think it's absolutely should be a part of the conversation but it should get a little more space yeah well you know i'm a free market comedian i i think it's a good total space like if you've ever been around other comedians like anybody out there in the world if you've ever been around two or three comedians who get together they just gleefully dump into every moray and uh taboo in the culture and just destroy right it. because we're all part of this sort of you know it's you're part of a club you already know you're in that it's okay to joke about anything right yeah and that's the you know that's part of the game is that nobody gets to joke about these things and in writers rooms you do um but as soon as you walk out of that room and you're a human being you don't say those things or think those things or act that way towards people it's language play you know, and it's comedy play, right? And it can't have limits, or it loses, you know, the the magic of it. And people, you know, there's good, there are good philosophical positions on both sides of that. Yeah. Hey, we can never give up basic humanity. <laughs> and comedians like, yeah, you can. But it's just, <laughs> just yeah. like games. I'm not making policy. Yeah, but I, but there's a, but. But we know as thoughtful grownups in the world, there's a difference between you and me in a car on our way to somewhere, the things we might say, and then the things that you say outside of the car, right? And if we're saying something outside of the car that's really <laughs> horrible. Outside of the clown car? Then, yeah, then maybe it's okay to have a conversation about that. I, I, don't, I don't mind the philosophy of the conversation. I just, I just think comics should get a little more birth. That's all. Yeah, I, I do too. I, like I said, I think they should be able to talk and think and feel fine about what they're saying and thinking uh, completely. Because if you start making comedians feel guilty or anxious or things like that, then you just start squeezing your comedy down more and more and you're going to get bad comedy. Yeah. But you, but well, all right. So how do you balance that with what you described in, in cringing and watching Eddie Murphy? I mean, he's saying something that's completely inappropriate and yucky and what do you do with that you're okay with that yeah it's just anachronistic you know it's like watching bob hope i hate watching bob hope because the comedy isn't funny you know but at the time <laughs> that was that was the pinnacle of comedy you can't judge anachronisms like that but that's not a that's not a moral thing that's just a we hadn't advanced enough to be off the cue cards in the simple con constructs yet maybe i mean like you know they took if you listen to some of their comedy, you know, it was, a lot of it was uh, pretty uh, unhumanistic. You know, it's about drunk okay. it's about all right. people. It's about, you know, it's all that stuff. Yeah, right. It's, ba it's basic and simple. And yeah, there's a bald guy. And a, right, right. Like, I can't watch old movies. Every comic character is some falling down alcoholic. I'm like, why was that f just the funniest thing to everybody? <laughs> I was thinking the other day I've been watching the last seasons of Viking, you know, that show on mm -mm. it's a, it's a knock, it's a poor man's game of Thrones on the history channel. Pretty well done. Kind of falls apart the last few seasons, like most shows, but uh, I was proud that they got to the second half of season six before they used a midget. 
<laughs> like, you know, it's about the Vikings and they finally broke down and like, ah, we got to get a dwarf in here. Come on. <laughs> But I, but the, I think the reason that there's not even more sort of fervor about comics is most of us are smart, thoughtful human people. You know, most comics are handling this themselves. They're not, they're not doing a chunk about faggots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most comics are in tune with the culture. You got to, you know, know the room, right? right. The temperature of the room. Right. But you know, I see these guys online that are folk stand-ups you know who are right-wingers and are trying to use the uh, stand-up uh tools and like there's a guy you know jp sears no you recognize him probably he's gotten a lot of play he's got long straight red hair he looks like a hippie and it's uh woke with jp Spe sears i think is his brand oh yeah yes yes, yes. and he does videos you know and they're very well produced he's obviously got some money behind it and he's super talented and funny He's very good on camera. Stuff's very well written, but it's just right wing claptrap bullshit. Right. You know, about the left is, but it's done very, very well. And great that he does it, but it, none of it's funny. You know, I mean, it's funny. Like he, he has all the right mechanisms, but ultimately hearing the bad logic inside the jokes ruins the jokes for me. <laughs> For you. I was going to say, yeah, that's depends where you sit, right? You know, skewed logic is skewed logic. Like if you're saying something that's not true in a joke, audience knows it and they reject it. Hmm. You know, like if you try to do men and women's humor on a few experiences, I'm sure you have. <laughs> if you uh, make comments about uh, females on stage as a male, you better be accurate. You know, because you're going to get massive instant blowback if you're not. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. But if you have a good, insightful, this is why, you know, shock comics and commentary comics, they earn the right by having a good idea, by being intellectually sound in what they're saying. And you can get away with it at that point because you can't argue the logic. Yeah. That's kind of what uh, Bill Burr does. He takes a preposterous point of view and then just convinces you of it. You know, he's just really good at. Yeah. That's exactly what he does. Louis right. C.K. did the same thing. Right. You know, and, um, um, Stanhope is even better at it. Stanhope's more intellectual about it. He goes deeper into the ideas and finds the uh, hypocrisy and uses that to justify, you know, his perspective. And it's great. You know, it's just hard to write that comedy. And if you're not oh. intellectually ready, you know, it's like all the guys who came out of Houston who thought they were uh, Kennison and Hicks and are not Kennison and Hicks. They right. don't have the brain power to, you know, charge up that machine. Right. I went right. after up after one of those guys. I used to work in Houston all the time, and I won't say who it was, but he did a guest spot, and he was in that whole outlaws, you know, ethos, and comes up just as like a Wednesday night. Who gives a shit about your outlawness? And he, <laughs> like ten minutes went off on you know, like um, Britney Spears, I think. And <laughs> just really into her and it really tore into her. And I came up on stage after him and I'm like, that guy really doesn't like Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, you tore her up, man. <laughs> anyway, back to comedy. I think I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun game. <laughs> but, you know, uh, comedy is a weird space. I just think, you know, we need to protect it as much as possible. You know, if you want good comedy to come out of it. Yeah, I agree with that. And and if you, you know, and if you have someone who's a little bit of, to use that word, a little bit of an outlaw and is saying the things outside of the car that you're only supposed to say inside the car, and that's the brand and that's the angle, then there has to be a space for that too. Uh, you know, I'm okay with that. I just, I understand that there's a social conversation that's happening about it. Um, and I, I accept that. I think some things we should be more careful and more human about. So, you know, yeah, I, I, and, I, yeah. I'm not who against would, the conversation who, broadly. Yeah. Who would argue against that if you're a decent person? Right. You know? But the, the reality is for me, it's like, I like to think of comedy as its own, its own bordered world. And if you want to be a serious person or a social issue person or dramatist or any of that stuff, 
and come into my world, pull one of my statements out, drag it over into your world, and then crucify it. Well, that's not fair. It's like saying, hey, that uh, that preacher, you know, during his sermon this week wasn't very funny. Yeah, that's right. And and taking something out completely out of context and hammering it in a different, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, well, then it becomes a political comes political talk. If you want to do political talk with me, or if you want to do like what I actually think, then let's do that. But if you want, if you want to, you know, experience my comedy and either laugh or don't great. If you don't laugh, that's fine. If you do laugh, that's great. But that's the whole interaction in comedy. Right. Like I don't yeah. hear anything else. It's certainly the key interaction. It's there's a big drop off to second place. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's literally nothing else. I don't need to hear your opinion of the joke. <laughs> In fact, when I do social media, I have a positive only policy. Like if you want to say anything to me on my Facebook or anything like that, if it's positive, great. Make me feel better. You know, because I'm working hard on this stuff and it's, a lot of it's in the vacuum and things like that. I would love I love praise. You know, give it to me. <laughs> If you, have, if you have anything neutral or you want to niggle on, you know, an uh, intellectual point I made, just shut up. <laughs> you draw the line at neutral. I don't want neutral. I don't. I, come on. I, I'm, I'm in this because it makes me feel good to make people happy. Seeing you yeah. not happy means I failed and I don't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good place, uh, I think, to uh, cut. We've been talking over an hour. Okay. We can talk forever. It's like when I was talking to Simmons. I, you know, I could talk to you guys forever. It's just so much yeah, man. and such a rich conversation. You know, so let's let's circle back around sometime, and we'll uh, we'll grab some more talk. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you want to uh, promote anything? Oh, um, yeah. Go to All Pro Lines Football Comedy Talk. Uh, it's, it's fun. It, we've been enjoying that. Uh, I've been really surprised and, uh, excited by the quality of the participation. We'll do a, you know, a setup and then a fill in the blank joke and, you know, people pile in with 75 punchlines and it's fun. Uh, so at all pro lines, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I've got a, uh, if this comes out before then on February 4th, I'm doing a rare zoom show, nowhere, comedy club.com. Uh, I promise a totally different hour from the one I did at the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm focusing on personal stuff, stories of me as a comic, stories of me as a kid, stories of me as a trying to be a grown up. Uh, so I'm trying to get more personal in the stand up. So come, cool. come check that, that out. Sounds great. I'll, I will watch that. All right. 10 for bucks sure. for you and everyone in the house. It's a bargain. <laughs> uh, charging for the zooms. Such a, <laughs> such a concept. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> well, uh, again, thanks, Kostaki. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll uh, still have a democracy for the next time we have one of these. It's done pretty well for the last 250 years. Maybe yeah. we can withstand another week of Trump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all we're trying to do now. Just hold on. It's like eight days. <laughs> but, uh, we will come back and, uh, again, check out Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, the course is there. Tons of free content. And uh, we will come back and see you soon. Thanks. Thanks, man.